the nature versus nurture debate has been a topic of discussion in the field of psychology for decades. This debate centers on whether an individual's behavior, personality, and cognitive abilities are primarily influenced by their genetic makeup, aka nature, or their environment and experiences, aka nurture. On the nature side of the debate, proponents argue that genetics play a significant role in shaping an individual's behavior and personality. Research has shown that certain traits, such as intelligence and temperament, have a strong genetic component. For example, studies have shown that identical twins raised in different environments still display similar levels of intelligence and personality traits. This suggests that genetic factors play a significant role in shaping an individual's behavior. In addition, proponents of the nurture argument point to the concept of evolutionary psychology, which suggests that certain behaviors and traits have been naturally selected over time due to their survival benefits. For example, the human capacity for language and social bonding may have evolved as a way to increase our chance of survival as a species. However, the nurture argument suggests that an individual's environment and experiences are the primary factors shaping their behavior and personality. Proponents argue that humans are born as blank slates, and their experiences and interactions with the world around them shape who they become. For example, a child who grows up in an abusive household may develop aggressive tendencies as a result of their environment. Furthermore, research has shown that environmental factors such as parenting style, socioeconomic status, and education can have a significant impact on an individual's cognitive abilities and personality traits. For example, children who grow up in poverty are more likely to experience stress and have lower levels of academic achievement, which can have long-lasting impact on their future success. Ultimately, it is important to recognize that both nature and nurture play a significant role in shaping an individual's behavior and personality. While genetics may predispose an individual to certain traits, their experiences and environment can either amplify or mitigate those predispositions. In today's case, we will see what happens when a problem is ignored until it's too late, and how terrifying that can be. Welcome back to another episode of Dreading, or if this is your first time here, welcome. Today we are going to be covering the case of Ella Bennett, and how her 13-year-old brother used her to get back at his mom. This video, along with the vast majority of our content, came at the request of our subscribers, and after looking into this case, I understand why. This case deals with the brutal death of a child, and if that is something you are not in a position to consume, click off of the video now. Before we begin, if there is a video you would like to see produced, or a case you would like to see more attention brought to, consider emailing my brother and I at dreading.official at gmail.com. We are constantly sifting through emails, responding, and writing scripts based on your suggestions, and plan to cover as many as we can. Now, let's begin. Charity Lee, by her own recollection, had a fairly normal, if not extremely nice, childhood. She was raised by two loving parents, had a live-in nanny, and never needed to worry about anything more than developing into a happy, healthy child, the way every child should be allowed to. That is, until she was six years old. Her parents, Bobby Bennett Jr. and Kyla Bennett, were extremely well off, running the Bennett trucking business, as well as using their business to transport drugs throughout the U.S. Bobby and Kyla were extremely clever, enterprising people, trafficking drugs throughout the country and making a fortune. It had been Bobby's idea to get into drug trafficking, as he had an extensive criminal history. His family had ties to the mafia, and throughout his life, he had made his money through illegal means. But Kyla took to it like a fish to water, especially because every asset that the family had was placed under her name, not her husband's. The business, the homes, the country club, all of it belonged to Kyla Bennett. But the marriage had soured along the way. Bobby had carried out multiple affairs with other women. According to testimony given by friends at the time, he enjoyed the attention his money provided him, and though he liked being a family man, he couldn't seem to shake his love of young women. This led to the couple briefly divorcing, although Charity probably wouldn't remember her family acting any differently during this time. Bobby and Kyla still spent a good amount of time together. They still cared for her roughly the same way that they always had, and it seemed as if their marriage, though dissolved, was still very much intact. The pair would eventually reconcile, choosing to get remarried in Vegas in March of 1980. However, just 57 hours later, Bobby would be murdered in the foyer of their shared family home. On March 12, 1980, Charity and her live-in nanny would be woken up by her mother much earlier than they were used to. It was out of character for Kyla to wake up either party, as she was an incredibly hands-off parent. But that morning, she made sure Charity and the nanny were out of the house early. Um, I had 
what I guess was, or what to me was, a normal childhood up until the age of six. Um, I had two parents. We were wealthy. We lived in Atlanta Country Club. We, you know, never wanted for anything. I remember my father drove a Rolls Royce Silver Shadow, and I blame that car on my car obsession. And um, I remember our home life being normal. I don't remember any fighting. I don't remember drama. I don't remember separations. I just remember being a happy kid up until the age of six. And then when I was six, on March 11th, 1980, my mother woke me and my, I had a nanny, of course I had a nanny, you know, woke the nanny and I up, um, took me to school early, uh, my mother took me to school, and my mother never took me to school, sent the babysitter to run some errands, and the next thing I know, uh, by the end of the day, I'm on a plane to North Carolina to go stay with my grandparents because my father had been murdered a couple of hours after we left the house. He had been shot four times at close range in the head, the back, the heart, and the chest. When I was 29, my husband, Charity's father, was murdered. Charity was five. I took her up to my parents' house as soon as it happened, and I told her that her dad had been shot. The only thing she said was, well, I'm glad it wasn't you, Mama. The crime scene was straightforward enough. Someone had come to the home, found Bobby, and shot him four times at close range. Given his ties to crime and his wealth, it wasn't ridiculous to think that someone he had screwed over or taken advantage of had done him in. But as the police began to investigate, fingers began to point to Kyla. Men came forward, stating that Kyla had propositioned them to kill her husband. She was tired of his drug use and philandering, and believed that he was no longer fit to control the company. She believed he was, quote, losing his touch, unquote, and wanted to be the sole owner of the Bennett Trucking Company. One man even went so far as to provide a diagram drawn on a paper napkin in Kyla's handwriting, showing the layout of the family home and where to find Bobby. So what I heard growing up was, you know, it was these guys that did it. It wasn't me. I was framed. I believed her. It wasn't until after Ella died that I really began to take a second look. So I went to Georgia and talked to the DA that prosecuted her, the detectives. And I ran across the report by the officer who transported my mother to the station that morning. You know, and he said, I saw her in the mirror and it seemed at times that she was really pleased with herself. They even had a napkin where my mother had drawn a map of the house and marked on there that this door would be unlocked. I think he had started doing drugs and getting sloppy. And I think she felt like her financial security was threatened. So she eliminated a problem. So this is what happened. My parents were not leading the normal life. My father was a chop shop guy and a drug trafficker and our company, our trucking company was used as a front for those businesses and my mother was the brains and she made it all legit. Well, evidently my father decided to start doing his drugs, it was getting a little out of control. My mother didn't like it and so to eliminate a threat to her future financial security, she had my father eliminated. She was arrested at the time. This is where she was when I was staying with my grandparents and didn't know why I couldn't go home. She had been arrested. 
she had been charged with murder one. Uh, allegedly, she hired a hitman, one of our drivers, to kill my father. She was tried and she was acquitted. Evidence clearly pointed to Kyla, and she would be arrested, charged, and tried for the crime. But she was acquitted of the crime. Kyla had presented herself as the grieving widow who was being framed by Bobby's family and business colleagues. At trial, she broke down whenever anything referring to his death was mentioned, making sure to appear meek and innocent as much as possible. Her lawyers stated that she was just a simple girl who had loved Bobby since she was 16. And despite her husband's criminal history, she was innocent in every way. She was a loving wife and mother. Whoever did this took away the one person she would ever truly love. Her lawyers argued that every person who Kyla had propositioned to kill her husband was just a plant sent by the real murderers meant to make her look guilty in the eyes of the law. And it worked. Following her father's death, Kyla was incredibly cruel to Charity. When her daughter would inevitably ask questions about her father, she would shut them down and emotionally withdraw from her child, leaving Charity in a place of emotional isolation and panic. She repeatedly stated that her father died because he was a horrible person. He was an evil person who deserved to die, and they were better off without him. When Charity asked questions about her father's death, her mom would shut her down completely, telling her that it was none of her business and that she didn't owe her anything. Walk up to this table, ask if I can sit down, and this one little girl, I still remember her, uh looks at me and says, you can't sit with us. Your mother murdered your father. I had never heard that before. I just knew that my dad was dead. So I went home. I asked my mom about it. And I will never forget the reaction I got either. It was cold, it was unemotional, it was, that's none of your business, we will not discuss this, I will never discuss this, I don't have to tell you about any of that, it's my life. And that's pretty much what I got for most of my life. She didn't talk about my father, she didn't tell me anything good about my father. I heard the most awful things about my father. As Charity grew up, her mother neglected her emotionally. She made her feel unwanted, as if she was never good enough, partially because she bore a striking resemblance to her father. She worked tirelessly in school and in sports, achieving more than anyone else her age. But her mother ignored her, saying at most, she was doing the bare minimum, and she wasn't going to praise mediocrity. Over time, when it occurred to Charity that being a straight-A student and high achiever wasn't getting her mother's attention, she began to do drugs. My teenage years, you're an adolescent, you want to know who your dad is. And when you're told constantly that your dad is just this horrible person that was gunned down, you start to think as a kid that maybe you're half horrible. Now that I'm an adult, I'm pretty sure that my mom didn't like me because if you see a picture of my daddy, she hated me because I was the living embodiment of what she killed. And I was in her face all the time. But as a child, you don't understand this. As a child, I grew up thinking that I was just horrible. So I did everything I could to make her love me or even better, approve of me, because nothing got her approval. I did it all. I skipped the 10th grade. I graduated from high school when I was 16. I played varsity soccer when I was only supposed to be on JV, and the whole time I did that in high school, I shot heroin. Anything to get my mother's attention. Up until Charity was 12 years old, she was the most wonderful, loving child that anyone could wish for. We were inseparable. And then from 12 on, it's been, it's like an alcoholic. It's up and down, up and down, up and down. But she'd get mad at me because I wouldn't allow her to do something. It was, well, you murdered my daddy. 
So she was a good manipulator. But we all are. Paris is. Ella was. I would be lying to you if I said that I wasn't. We all manipulate each other. We're all spoiled rotten. My other daughter, Caitlin, I don't think she's quite as good. She didn't have as good a teacher because I don't do it so much anymore. I don't have a company to manipulate. I don't have drivers to manipulate. And I don't have a jury to manipulate. So. She always used to like to tell people that I was the perfect child until I was 12, and then I made her life hell. Charity continued to do well, graduating early and overcoming every academic hurdle set out before her. Even though she was high the entire time, she didn't hide the use from her mother, actively trying to goad her mom into giving her some kind of attention. But even as she became addicted to heroin at 16 years old, her mother barely cared. Kyla was more concerned with appearances than she was with her daughter's well-being. And when Charity asked her mother for help and to send her to rehab, she balked. Kyla rejected the notion, and only after desperately pleading with her mother did she concede, eventually deciding to send Charity to a rehab center three states away, so no one in their town would know of her shame. She told the rehab not to give Charity any medication to make her withdrawals easy, stating outright she wanted her daughter to do it cold turkey to properly teach her a lesson. I almost died. I was 18. I weighed 80 pounds. And I begged my mother to take me to treatment. And she wouldn't. She told me it was a phase that I was going through. She didn't want to be embarrassed by me. So I told her if she didn't help me, that she would just be as just as responsible for taking me out of the world as she was for bringing me into it because I was asking for help. So my mom missed 1% found a state-run treatment facility three states away so nobody would know who we were. It was for adults. I was a juvenile. She told them don't give her anything. Let her do this cold turkey. She's weak anyway. Let her hurt. If she leaves, don't call me. Call the cops. I don't care anymore. I was 18. She gave me 100 bucks. She told me do what you will with it. Find yourself for treatment. Overdose. I don't care anymore, Charity. You make my life too difficult. Sobriety wasn't everything that Charity had thought it would be, though. She had been repeatedly told in rehab that sobriety would change her life, but she couldn't help but feel as if that was a lie. She had begun to use drugs to cope with her childhood trauma and need for validation, and those issues didn't disappear now that the drugs were gone. If anything, they got worse, because even in her time of need, her mom could only think of herself. And then about a semester through college... I had been sober for a little over a year. I was absolutely miserable. Miserable. Everybody kept telling you, you get sober, it's going to be so much better. I'm like, when? When? Because it's not. So I had made up my mind that if I was not, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm 19 at this time. What, a little over 18, 19. I was 19. You know, we're kind of dramatic. And I'm like, if I am not happy, happy, in three months, that's it. I'm killing myself. A month after her decision, she would become pregnant with her firstborn, Paris. From the second Charity realized that she was pregnant, she fell in love with life. While she had never considered parenthood before, her own childhood gave her a profound understanding of the kind of parent she wanted to be, and she immediately felt drawn to giving her child the life she wished that she had. She didn't want to be the kind of parent that her mother was. She didn't want her children to wonder if they were wanted or cared for, and she threw herself into parenthood head first. Paris's father had been in the picture early on in the pregnancy, and Charity believed that they could be a normal nuclear family. But after finding out about the pregnancy, he left her. Eventually, He would make his way back into her life, but shortly thereafter, he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, with visual and auditory hallucinations. Charity raised him as a single mother, with help from her own mother at times, 
although she tried to maintain some healthy boundaries for her own well-being, Kyla would characterize these boundaries as being ridiculous and repeatedly stated that her daughter was being dramatic. My mom was extremely beautiful woman. She has been married seven times, eight times. I can't remember if she has Liz Taylor beat yet or not. Some of the things I did weren't probably very motherly. Um, you know, I, I started drinking some, did some drugs. I mean, I didn't do them in front of her. I mean, she had nannies. But, um, you know, I probably wasn't there. I didn't give her all the attention that she wanted. She, she seemed to want quite a bit. When she talked about why she didn't want to be around her, Paris was a calm child never going out of his way to make a fuss or act out. He was extremely smart and when tested, was found to have an IQ of 141. He had a tendency to talk down to people though, and treat people as though they weren't as intelligent as him, and therefore lesser than him. But he was also incredibly charismatic. He had the ability to read a room, and manipulate others to do his bidding. If he wanted something, a simple no would never suffice. He wasn't like the other children who would throw tantrums until they got what they wanted, throwing and breaking toys while screaming. He was more methodical, purposely hurting himself until he was given what he wanted. On one occasion, he bashed his head into a wall, refusing to stop even when he started to bleed until he was finally given what he wanted. As he got older, his methodology changed. He began to debate his point, outwitting whoever he was talking to until they eventually gave him what it was that he wanted. If that didn't work, he would punish them, going out of his way to make their life harder in an incredibly intricate and well thought out way. Many adults regarded him well, treating him as if he was one of them and not a child. When Paris was nine, Charity became pregnant once again, this time with a daughter she named Ella. Throughout the pregnancy, Paris was incredibly angry and agitated, unhappy that he would no longer be an only child. On multiple instances, he made his feelings known, describing how upset the idea of another child living under his roof made him. But most adults in his life regarded his unhappiness as simply being jealous. Charity was told repeatedly that this kind of reaction was normal in children, especially ones Paris's age. They told her that eventually, Paris would warm up to the idea, and it seemed, after the birth of her daughter, he did. Ella wasn't like her brother. Where Paris was quiet, calculating and reserved, Ella was loud and boisterous. She would say whatever it was that she was thinking, and it was rare that she thought through her actions before she did them. She was opinionated and emotional, and acted as a normal child. For the first few years, Paris appeared to be a loving and attentive brother. He would wait on his sister, hand and foot, taking care of any problem she ran into, big or small. People would comment to Charity and Kyla that they were so lucky to have a son who loved his sister so much, but it would seem that the love was a deliberate deception, meant to gain the trust of those around him, and unfortunately, it worked. At the age of 13, Paris had begun to display more and more worrying behavior. When he felt slighted or wronged, he would justify any action, no matter how violent. If his sister tried to speak over him, he would lash out. If his mom tried to fix his hair, he would hit her and he had become completely unmanageable. Kyla and Charity had worked out a schedule so that he would spend half of the time living with his grandmother and half of the time with his mother and sister. That way, he was more manageable. But even that had failed to help the situation. In November 2006, Paris attacked his mother with a knife. Charity, being an adult, was able to get away unharmed. But it was clear that Paris had wanted to cause real harm to her and knowing that he had just started puberty and would likely become stronger than her in the coming year, Charity decided to try and get him treatment. She brought Paris to a treatment center for troubled youth in Wichita Falls, with the hopes that they would be able to figure out what was happening to Paris. Charity hoped that if they were given a name, they would be able to come up with a game plan to better help him and give him the care he needed. But instead, she was told that Paris was dealing with real homicidal desires and that it was likely he was going to act on them soon. They didn't provide a way forward beyond her just leaving Paris under their care and Charity was forced with a choice. She could leave her son in treatment the way her mother had left her and deal with potentially harming her son the same way that she had been hurt or she could bring him home, work with him, and find a different way forward. So she decided to bring him home. This portion of the video includes graphic descriptions of Ella's murder. Please pause the video now if that is not something you can listen to. Thank you. On February 5th, 2007, 
Charity left Paris and Ella under the care of a 17-year-old babysitter while she went to work as a waitress at Buffalo Wild Wings. Paris was angry at Charity that night because in the months prior, she had relapsed into using cocaine. He wanted to make his mother pay for what he believed was her moral failing and determined that the best, most effective way to make her hurt was to take her children away from her. Throughout their childhoods, Charity had repeatedly told her children that she would never let anything happen to them, and Paris thought it would be poetic that her child would take her others away. He convinced the babysitter that she wasn't needed and that she should go home. Shortly after she left, he began watching violent pornography, specifically scenes of rape and murder. He then proceeded to go into his sister's room, where she lay sleeping, and sexually abused her. As he sexually assaulted his sister, he repeatedly stabbed her multiple times. Charity would later write in her book, he sexually abused her that night, and he admitted that the more violent he became, the more excited he became, ending in death for her and climax for him. His stabs were slow and methodical, not frenzied, not an uncontrollable rage. He then continued to stab and batter her body, attempting to cover up any signs of the sexual abuse he had put her through. After brutalizing and killing his four-year-old sister, Paris called a school friend, who he talked to for six minutes before ultimately deciding to call the police. Everything Paris states in this interview is a lie, meant to ensure that he doesn't have to deal with the consequences of his actions. Remember, this is a 13-year-old boy who just tortured and murdered his sister and he has thought through his actions so much that he is already planning for an insanity defense. Hello? Abilene 911, go ahead. I was hallucinating. You were hallucinating? Yes. I woke up and I thought she was a demon and I killed her. Mm -hmm. Now what's your sister's name? Her name is Ella. Ella Bennett. How what old is Ella? Four. She's four years old? How old yes. are you? Thirteen. Is she bleeding anywhere? Yes, yeah, she's bleeding all over the bed. Because I stabbed her. What did you stab her with? I... Okay, where'd you stab her? Um, lots of places. I want you to start CPR, okay? What I want you to do is take her off the bed. And no, her... I know for a fact that she's dead because I... Do you stabbed... want to go ahead and try? It might still help, okay? No, I, I don't think it'll help because... Come on, Paris, I... work with me. I know I stabbed her lots of times. Okay, she's on the floor, but I can't stay here because she's all bloody and Paris, stuff. What I want you to do is I want you to put your hands on her chest. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I want you to push 30 times. I want you to count. Okay. All the way to 30, and then blow two breaths in her mouth. Okay? Okay. One, two, three, four. Bye. Paris never attempted CPR on his sister. He threw her body on the ground, where she laid face down until the paramedics arrived. He is currently faking his attempt to save her life. When the cops arrived, Paris was promptly arrested. He maintained that he didn't mean to kill his sister, and that he'd been hallucinating due to some underlying mental illness, and thought he was killing a pumpkin-headed demon. However, the next day, he admitted that that wasn't true. He told the police and his mother he had deliberately planned to kill his sister to get back at his mother, and thought going to prison would be worth it, as long as it caused her pain. He told them that his initial plan was to kill his mom, but he realized that that would be too quick. If he was to kill her, she would only be in pain for 10-15 minutes tops, whereas if he killed the person she loved, she would have to deal with the pain of knowing she couldn't save her only daughter, and her son, who she loved, was responsible. Paris pled guilty to his sister's murder and was sentenced to 40 years in prison, but will become eligible for parole as early as 2027. While in prison, Paris has done a number of interviews, stating that while he is responsible for killing his sister, he takes full ownership of his actions. He is not mentally ill or deranged. He has advocated for his own release, and in 2019, sat down to speak with Pierce Morgan about his crimes. While usually I would go over this interview, the interview is already being amplified by the experts they bring in throughout and I will simply leave a link where you can watch it in full. Charity continues to speak to Paris to this day, showing him unconditional love as she feels it is her job. That said, experts have encouraged her to go into hiding as soon as possible, as if Paris is ever released from prison, it is likely that he will go out of his way to harm her and her new son. If you have made it to this portion of the video, thank you for watching. This case was one of the more difficult cases to research and report on, so I hope you are doing alright in the aftermath. If you are interested in seeing more content like this, let me know by leaving a like and subscribing if you have not already done so. With all of that said, remember to have a good day and stay safe.